What do you think about computation as a language? I think it's a very poor language. A lot of people think it's a really great one, but I, I think it has some nice properties. Um, but I, I think the the feature of it that you know is is compelling is this kind of idea of universality that like you can if you if you if you have a language, you can describe things in any other language. Well, for me, one of the people who kind of revealed the expressive power of computation, aside from Alan Turing, is Stephen Wolfram through all the explorations of like cellular automata type of objects that uh, he did in, in a new kind of science and afterwards. So what, what do you get from that? Like, the, um, the kind of computational worlds that are revealed through even something as simple as cellular automata. Like, it seems like that's a really nice way to explore languages that are far outside our human languages and do so rigorously and understand how those kinds of complex systems can inter interact with each other, can emerge, all that kind of stuff. Um, I don't think that they're outside our human languages. I think they define the boundary of the space of human languages. They allow us to explore things within that space, which is also fantastic. But I think there is a set of ideas that takes, and, and Stephen Wolfram has worked on this quite a lot um, and contributed very significantly to it. And, um, you know, I really like some of the stuff that Stephen's doing with, like, his physics project, but don't agree with a lot of the foundations of it. But I, I think the space is really fun that he's exploring. Um, you know, there's this assumption that computation is at the base of reality. And I kind of see it at the top of reality, <laughs> um, not at the base, um, because I think computation was built by our biosphere. It's, a, it's something that happened after many billion years of evolution. Um, and it doesn't happen in every physical object. It only happens in some of them. And I think one of the reasons that we feel like the universe is computational is because it's so easy for us as things that have the theory of computation um, in our minds. And actually, in some sense, it, it might be related to the functioning of our minds and how we build uh, languages to describe the world and sets of relations to describe the world. Um, but it's easy for us to go out into the world and build computers. And then we mistake our ability to do that with assuming that the world is computational. And I'll give you a really simple example. This one came from John Conway. I, I one time had a conversation with him, um, which was really delightful. He was really fun. Um, but he was pointing out that if you, um, you know, string lights in a barn, uh, you know, you can you can program them to have your favorite one-dimensional CA, uh, and you might even be able to make them, you know, do a, like be capable of universal computation. Is universal computation a feature of the string lights? Well, no. No, it's probably not. It's a feature of the fact that you as a programmer had a, a theory that you could embed in the physical architecture of the string lights. Now, what happens, though, is we get confused by this kind of distinction between us as agents in the world that actually can transfer things that life does onto other physical substrates with what the world is. And so, for example, you'll see people... Uh, you know, doing studying the mathematics of chemical reaction networks and saying, well, chemistry is Turing universal, or studying the laws of physics and saying the laws of physics are Turing universal. But anytime that you want to do that, you always have to prepare an initial state. You have to, uh, you know, you have to constrain the rule space, and then you have to actually be able to demonstrate the properties of computation. And all of that requires an agent or a designer to be able to do that. But it gives you an intuition. If you look at a 1D or 2D cellular automata, it gives you, uh, it allows you to build an intuition of how you can have complexity emerge from very simple beginnings, very simple initial conditions. I think that's the intuition that people have derived from it. The intuition I get from cellular automata is that the flat space of an initial condition in a fixed dynamical law is not rich enough to describe an open-ended generation process. And so the way I see cellular automata is they're embedded slices in a much larger causal structure. And if you want to look at a deterministic slice of that causal structure, you might be able to extract a set of consistent rules that you might call a cellular automata, but you could embed them as much larger space. That's not dynamical and is about the causal structure and relations between all of those computations. And that would be the space uh, cellular automata live in. And I think that's the space that uh, Stephen is talking about when he talks about his ruliad and these hypergraphs of all these possible computations. 
But I wouldn't take that as my base reality because I think, again, computation itself, this abstract property computation is not at the base of reality. So can we just uh, linger on that Ruliad? This, yeah. Uh, a what, One Ruliad to rule them all. <laughs> yeah. So what? this is part of uh, Wolfram yeah. Physics Project. It's what he calls the entangled limit of everything that is computationally possible. So yeah. what, what's your problem with the Ruliad? Well, it's interesting. So so Stephen came to a workshop we had in the Beyond Center in the fall, and the workshop theme was mathematics. Is it evolved or eternal? And he gave a talk about the Ruliad, and he was talking about how, uh, you know, a lot of the things that we talk about in the Beyond Center, like, does reality have a bottom? You know, if it has a bottom, what is it? Um, you know, like, <laughs> what's I need to, the... <laughs> I, need to, I need to go... I need we'll to have go you to one this. sometime. <laughs> oh, this is great. Um, but, Does reality have a bottom? Yeah. So we had one that was, um, it was called um, Infinite Turtles or Ground Truth. And it was really just about this this, this issue. But the, but the thing that was interesting, I think, I think Stephen was trying to make the argument that, you know, fundamental particles aren't fundamental. Gravitation is not fundamental. Uh, you know, these are just uh, turtles. And computation is fundamental. And I just, I, I remember pointing out to him, I was like, well, computation is your turtle. And I think it's a weird turtle to have. <laughs> First of all, isn't it okay to have a turtle? It's you know? totally fine to have a turtle. Everyone has a turtle. Mm -hmm. You can't build a theory without a turtle. Yeah. Um, it's just, um, so it depends on the problem you want to describe. And I actually, the, the reason I can't get behind Stephen's ontology is I don't know what question he's trying to answer. And without a question to answer, I don't understand why you're building a theory of reality. And the question you're trying to answer is... Uh, what life did, is. What life is, which another which will, simpler way of phrasing that is how did life originate? Well, I started working on the origin of life. Um, and I think what my challenge was there was no one knew what life was. And so you can't really talk about the origination of something if you don't know what it is. And so the way I would approach it is if you want to understand what life is, then proving that physics is solving the origin of life. So there's the theory of what life is, but there's the actual demonstration that that theory is an accurate description of the phenomena you aim to describe. So again, they're the same problem. It's not like I can decouple origin of life from what life is. It's it's like that is the problem. Um, and I the the point I guess I'm making about having a question is no matter what slice of reality you take, what regularity of nature you're going to try to describe, there will be there there will be an abstraction that unifies that structure of reality um hopefully um and and that will have a fundamental layer to it right because you have to explain something in terms of something else but so if i want to explain life for example then my fundamental description of nature has to be something i think that has to do with time being fundamental but if i wanted to describe um I don't know, the sort of interactions of uh, matter and light, you know, I have elementary particles be fundamental. Um, if I want to describe electricity and magnetism in the 1800s, I have to have waves um, be fundamental, right? So like you, you ha or in quantum mechanics, like it's a wave function that's fundamental because that's the the sort of explanatory paradigm of your theory. Um, so I guess I don't know what problem saying computation is fundamental solves? Doesn't he want to understand how does the basic quantum mechanics and general relativity emerge? Yeah, but and that's, how does time right? So I think then that doesn't really answer an important no, question for us. Well, I think that the issue is general relativity and quantum mechanics are expressed in mathematical languages, mm -hmm. and then computation is a mathematical language. So you're basically saying that maybe there's a more universal mathematical language for describing theories of physics that we already know. Mm -hmm. That's an important question, and I do think that's what Stephen's trying to do and do well. Um, but it's then the question becomes, does that formulation of a more universal language for describing the laws of physics that we know now tell us anything new about the nature of reality? Or is it a language? And to you, languages are fundamental, can't be fundamental. <laughs> The language itself is never the fundamental thing. It's whatever it's describing. 